Good morning. Um, those are the, so you, you should have gotten the, um, the exams graded, right? So if you have any I just looked at the true or false um, answers. If you have any explanation on, on different answer, talk to me, right? So the, the first question we actually went through in class, right? The first one we, we discussed it the, the day before the exam, the exact same wording. Um, and I think part, uh, question four also we discussed in, in class, because we had the, the graph up there. Um, for question five, I suspect that you can answer, um, the answer I, I get it was true, but if you answered false because you said file systems don't, don't do data integrity or something, like, you know, then I could consider that too. So if you did anything like that, let me know, right? I think I, 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 I saw one person who mentioned that um, file systems don't do that, right? I didn't ask that, I was asking if you had to do data integrity, what do you have to do, but I mean, if that's, that's your line of thinking, then that's fine too. Right. Were there any surprises in the, in the set of questions or answers? <coughs> so the, the grades are um, more skewed towards the positive side, and that, that may be because people are now choosing what to answer kind of stuff, right? And we only have only one who got everything right. Um, which is a little worse than before, because we usually have two or three who get gets it all right. Um, what is more interesting is probably this one, and, and it's in <coughs> colors you can't probably see it. So the one smooth line is the overall grades I have so far for the class, right? And the the three other other lines show what, what was the grade for the corresponding student for um, the projects and the and the exams. And, and the exams are lower than the average, and the projects are higher than the average. So it's kind of like sort of in the middle, right? So um, in terms of like what that translates to letter grades, I don't know. I would, I would like something like like up in the top. So I'm hoping that it's kind of clear where you say like that first person should be a different grade than the second one. So if I were to give grades, you know, that's A, A minus, B plus, B, or something that's like like big, big stuff, right? Um, but the the grade so far is like a fairly flat thing. So on the reverse side, you should have the exact numbers there so far, right? So if, if two grades are off by fraction of a point, then <clears throat> they would end up getting the same kind of grade. So. Yes. As far as final letter grades go, where are you thinking that's going to end up about right now? The distribution. Uh, distribution of what? Like, what's going to be an A, what's going to be a B? Right now, it's just all part. It's, it's kind of hard, right? I'm not, so, I'm not a, so, if you're asking, am I, like, do I have a number of how many A's I want, how many B's yes. I want, kind of stuff, then I don't have a policy, right? So. Um, like, where's the cutoff for an A going to be number-wise? I would like the cutoff to be like at least one point difference, one whole percentage point difference. So if, it's, if it keeps going down by half a half kind of thing, then um, it's kind of hard, but like I, I would say like anything over 75, I can't really say it, it's so close that it's it's kind of hard to figure out what the grade is, right? We are only up to 66% of the grade so far. I can tell that like, the person who's got like close to 51, they are not likely to get an A with that score, right? I mean, they have to, I mean, that's, that's a clear distinction between that one and this one. So if you look at the, the, the numbers, right? Um, You know, so there's like 81.32 and 81.85. It's it just like some number I see, right? So they both would get the same year. So kind of go from there to see where things are. I know it's not kind of exact, but I'm not going to go with the over 90s, eh, over, you know, those 
fix it things. I'm, I'm just going to fix it. So all I can promise is, if you get over 90, you will definitely get an A. But you know, that's the that's not what you want, right? You want no. <laughs> Average includes this test, right? That we got back today. I'm sorry. Does this exam average include the test that we got back today? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it includes everything I have so far. Right. It's, it's kind of hard to I, mean, I think everybody's either everybody's doing good or everybody's doing bad, right? But on, on average, the whole class is sort of together, right? So I would like to think everybody's doing good because I think that's my, that's my sense. So um, and like like I said, in in K, you know, like, I, I like to look at the whole grades. I think some of the people who got a 50 didn't get a 50 because they got stuff terrible. I think they skip some of the assignments or homeworks for, for whatever reason, right? So when you see somebody who's gotten like 13%, that's because they kind of skip some homework assignments. And like I said, there's not a whole lot I can do if you skip as a homeworks, right? Because um, I can't work with you. But, but if you have any questions about individual grades, talk to me. Um, we still have a third of the grades to go. And so the the from now on, the class is more analytical. So if you looked at the, 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 the course project for, you know, the last course project, how many of you looked at the course project, right? So what is your impression? It's more like, it's not very, it's more analytical. I want you to look at how the systems are. And I think the, the final exam is going to be like that. The, um, the next model exam is going to be like that. How do you put what you learned into a real system kind of stuff, which is more squishy than, um, Precise numbers, right? What that means is there won't be a true or false kind of question. There'll be stuff you have to answer in writing, right? So, so are there any questions about what we covered so far? And are there any questions about the homework project, the last homework project? It, it, it does look, you know, uh, sort of simple, but I, I, I still hope that you don't wait till the end because you still have to um, look around systems unless you are really comfortable with, with, with the machine you are working in, right? Um, it's one of those things that you would rather finish it sooner and then get it over with, right? So, was there a consensus on when we're going to have the final exam? I saw a lot of emails and then it kind of um, didn't look like there's a consensus. Right? Would it make sense if, if people did a take home exam? <coughs> take home in the sense that it'll, it'll be like that in class. I'm not going to do a take home, take home exam, right? Because a take home exam usually is it's tuned to the amount of time that was assigned, right? You know the difference between take-home exam and uh, in-home exam taken home, right? Because if you do a take-home exam and I give you one week, then you expect it to work on that for a week to answer those questions. But what I would do is give the two-hour exam that you would do in class as a take-home exam. Uh, so if that may be uh, a way to go, right? So. That's one option, or, or over the, I think, I think over the weekend would be a lot easier to deal with than trying to find another time because it's, like I say, it's an industry hard problem, and I don't think anybody has, has figured out a way to solve the um, you know, whole set of constraints, right? So, So the other other thing I would like to do is this is the first time this the OS class is being offered by me. So one of the things I would I would like for this class to sort of write up a um, little stuff on which will help the you know the future students, right? Not, not the sort of thing that you'll say avoid this class like a plague because you can't because it's a it's a core course, right? So you're kind of stuck with that one. And I am teaching the course next semester, so you can't say choose a different instructor too, right? But other nuggets of like how, what, what would help you prepare for the class kind of stuff, right? So I'm kind of making all the videos and stuff available for the future students, but also something like that that, yeah, um, people can put up. 
some schools do that as as uh, as a policy for all classes. I think MIT does that as a general thing, where the students kind of collect all this information and put that up. So, um, so usually TCEs are on a one-way street. I mean, you make a TCE comment, but you never get to see it. Nobody gets to see it except certain you know people that won't affect the future stu students, right? So I would like something like that. So if you think it's something was useful, something would have helped you in better taking something. Um, you can either send it to me, but if you're worried about anonymity, you can either wait after the class is over, or I would, I would like somebody to collect all of those, remove any, any notions of who you are, and send it up. So I, I'll, I'll, I promise to put it up, as you said, on the web page. Right? So, so, so we have two more topics left before we start looking at uh, machines and stuff. And, and the, the two topics involve security and, and um, access control and, and mechanisms like that. <coughs> right. So far, we looked at a whole bunch of policies on managing CPUs and disks and memory and what have you. And all of them assume that you just have access to them. There is no, no protection. There is a way to protect the kernel from the user. But other than that, there is no explicit mechanisms to say, who should get access to what objects and stuff like that, right? And as you can imagine, on a multi-user system, that's not a good thing. You don't, we don't want everybody to have access to everything. So you want to be able to control some aspects of what, what is possible, not, not just between the user and the supervisor mode, but more detail in terms of what they are exactly allowed to do, right? And if you use <laughs> Java, you, you, you may be used to some of these mechanisms. You may be used to the notion that Java, depending on how it's run, right, if you're running as an app, that it does not let you open all the files. It lets you open certain files, not other files. It lets you open certain network connections, not other connections and stuff. And those, are, those sort of things are becoming more and more popular, more and more important, right? It'll be really nice if, you, if your virus, all it can do is you know, have access to certain files, not not everything else. Even though it's running as you, but not having the, the ability to touch everything, right? So that's the notion. That's an, uh, that, that's the stuff we're looking at. And so essentially, the problem of protection is trying to make sure that only the right set of processors will have access to your uh, your, your data. And the the guiding principle in all this stuff is is, is the principle of least privilege, which basically says that. Um, the application should have just enough privilege to do what it needs to do, right? It should have the least amount of privileges. If it wants more privileges, it has to escalate it through some explicit mechanism. So it can ask you for a supervisor password. It can, it can ask you something to do stuff it, it does not want to do. So the, the, the principle of least principle says, privilege says that by default, applications should have no more privileges than they need, right? And that's a worthy goal, and that, that, that pre prevents you from um, causing damage than, than you need to, right? So how many of you run on a daily basis as a supervisor? If, if you're in Windows, how many of you run as administrator? If you are Mac, run as administrator. If you are Linux, run as root, what have you. So I, I see like six or seven or you know, a few people <coughs> running a supervisor, right? Which kind of violates this principle, right? So, wh why why do you run it as supervisor? I format every the end of every semester, and although every kind of board is too much of a hassle to switch accounts. Mm -hmm. Is that the um, is that the answer? Why you're running as Administrator for this. So if you if you that that's that's an excellent point. I mean, like you're running at the least privileges is it's sort of a pain, right? Because if you know exactly what privileges you need, that's 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 a good thing. But sometimes you don't necessarily know exactly what you need. So you kind of instead of being asked all the time, you know, can you give me the password to escalate and become supervisor? It's tempting to run as supervisor all the time and not have to worry about the privilege failing, right? So the real problem here is not just how do you provide mechanisms, but how do you provide, provide mechanisms that are useful enough, right? So the least principles, the least privilege principle would say, 
just give the barest minimum possible, right, for you to complete. And usually you don't know exactly what that is, so you kind of give a little bit more, right? And some of you chose to go all the way over to get all the, all the privileges. And what the right balance is, that's the hardest thing, right? So, but we'll, we'll, we'll look at mechanisms which, which abide by this uh, philosophy. But on a real machine, the, the hardest part is, how do you specify it, how do you enforce it, how do you make, make that uh, little thing uh, useful, right? And, and that's the, <coughs> that's the uh, so how many of you have been bitten by running as a supervisor and doing stuff that you didn't intend to, right? For example, if you do rm slash, rm minus rm slash, right, in, in Linux, if you're a normal user, you don't have privileges, so even if you make a mistake, it, you're kind of okay, like I said, you know, it says you can't do that, right? You, you answered, you. Yeah, I can do stuff. Yeah, so that that I mean, so this is the international. I mean, this is the user running the stuff. So if you if you had a wireless running as you, right? So that's that's one of the things. So when you have viruses and unwanted processes running, right? How they run as makes a big difference. So if, if they're running as me and I have least privileges, then the amount of damage it does is minimal compared to if I was running as a supervisor, right? <coughs> So the, the notion here is 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 um, so you, you define access access right as a as a domain right so <coughs> domain you you kind of encapsulate all the access rights that belong to um, certain objects and so you, then you have a notion of overlapping uh, accesses right so if you want to be able to read an object modify something right object then you you have overlapping access you should be able to do you know one the other one and the next one right. Or if you're op operating on certain objects, you so you, you you define what are the set of accesses that particular user or role should have for the objects, and stay with that. And the the domain structure defines that notion notion of what are the what are the privileges I have as this user, right? And like I mentioned, that you know the the Unix Unix system model has only two modes. One is the user and the other one is the supervisor. Within user there are different, there can be different users and each one of them is compartmentalized to have its own um, protection mechanism. Right? So each user can, can choose to protect their data from each other. And then you have the supervisor or the root who has access to most, most any content. Right? And there are ways to, to elevate or give better privileges and one of them is the set UID bit. So in, in the file system, if in the file for a program, if you set a, a, set a special bit, then essentially it runs as the owner of the file rather than the user who's running it, right? So if I do a set UID as root, so while I'm running the program, I essentially become the supervisor, right? I can do set ID for somebody else too, right? So that's one way to escalate your, your privileges, essentially become acquire rights that you didn't have before to do other, other, other tasks. The other command is the sudo command, which, which many of you have used, right? Sudo command essentially gives you a super user access for just that, for that little bit. And the system actually lets you control a lot more of the stuff. So I, I could say for the sudo, for example, who can do the sudo and what commands they can run, right? For the class I gave anybody to do anything. So you basically did a shell and then you had full access, right? But you can specify that you can only run, make, only run GCC or, or what have you. Right. So Unix has this two <coughs> levels of model, and, and that's, it, it's, it's simple, but it, it has issues because it's not expressive enough. The other model is the Multix, which is actually the operating system which came before Unix. Unix came out of uh, Multix, because Multix did everything, and it solved every problem known to mankind at that time and more, right? So Unix was a ripoff of the name to basically say it'll do only a few things uh, simple, right? So Unix, uh, Multics had a notion of, of privilege rings. Essentially, it, it's, it's similar to Unix in the sense that Unix has two rings, right? You you're either have the core supervisor and then the rest of the users outside. Whereas here there are multiple levels and as you go deeper and deeper into the center, you, ha you are more privileged as you're further and further away, you are less privileged. And to go from one level to the other level, 
you have to go through sort of gateways and sort of like system calls kind of thing. So you don't just jump from one to the other. So you kind of you kind of elevate your privileges through an order mechanism, and then you you remove it through order mechanism. The idea here is you can just get the right amount of privileges without having going all the way to a super super user, right? In fact, multi multics had a, a much higher security rating from the so there's a government agency which ranks the operating system for how much control it gives and stuff, and, and Multics was sort of at the B level, right? And where A is the highest, B, C, D, and so on, right? So because you can actually specify exactly what level you, sh you, you are allowed to go, right? You have more control over what, how things happen. So this brings up a notion of how do you specify these access rights, right? So in, in the Unix model, essentially, if you if you are a certain user, you have all the rights that you want to. Uh, so if I'm a user, certain thing, so I can access all <coughs> files which are owned by me, right? I can essentially operate on all files that have group access to my group, and I, I can operate on any file which have global access, right? And that's that's a pretty close kind of stuff. So in a, in a more formal sense, the notion of protection can be uh, implemented using two mechanisms. One is the access matrix, right? The access matrix no notion is for every object, right, you specify what are the, what are the options that, that can be done by a certain user, right? So here's a, here's a, um, a way of showing that. So for every object, for every domain, what are the sort of, uh, what operations that, that the domain can do, right? So users belong to a certain domain. So it, so through some other, some mechanisms, you become part of a domain where you have certain access privileges. So if you are logged into domain D1, it says that you are able to access F1, right, an object F1, which may be a file or CPU or, or any other things we, we, we looked at so far, right? So anything can be expressed using access matrix by specifying what's the domain you're talking about and what are the privileges. And privileges can be read, write, execute, or, or we'll see other, other mechanisms that we, we talked about, right? So, and this is pretty expressive because it basically says all the, all the things that anyone can do. So you can exactly precisely say whether you should be able to uh, read F2, right? And this is a big problem because when you, when you look, if it's not expressive enough, you can't look at an object and say, what access some certain users should have, or who has access to it, right? If you worked in Unix model, right, if it says group access as read, it's very hard to figure out who are all members of the group who can access this this object. Whereas here, you can you can say it in gory details, right? So, what would be one of the problems with using this model? Yes. Yeah, one of the, yeah, one of the things will be will be huge, right? Because for every resource, for every domain, right? So if I want to be more expressive, I want to have more domains, right? And by the nature of the system, there are more objects, right? Systems tend to have hundreds of thousands of files, so you're going to have a, a really big matrix, which may be sparse for the most part, right? For example, the files owned by me. None of you may have access to it because you know I, I, I didn't want to give access to you. So essentially, that particular <coughs> line will be empty. So everything that is owned by me by you, right, would be empty. So it's a sparse matrix, and it could be huge, and it potentially will keep growing, right? As I add more files, as I add more stuff, it keeps growing, and managing that is, is a big problem, right? And so you can't really implement it as it is because you know somebody somebody have to keep the <coughs> access right. And every time the OS has to do something, it has to check against it, right? So if you want to open a file, it has to look into that to say, okay, do you have open access? You know, do you have read access? Do you have write access, or, or what have you? And potentially, so it, it has to be in, in memory, and that can be a, a slow, slow thing, right? And and that's essentially what 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 the uh, stuff was talking about. So the <laughs> let's go back to the stuff. So the, the sort of operations you can, you can allow are read, write, and, and what have you, right? So there are other operations that you want to add to this mechanism, right? One of the stuff is, in any of the systems, if you collaborate, I ought to be able to give somebody else another access, right? <coughs> so the question is, 
who should fill this stuff and how does it exist? If this access matrix was somehow magically created by somebody and it's static, right, then it becomes very hard to use. Right? So for example, I cannot say, I created this source code that I want you to look at, right? but I can't give you access because you're not in my domain, I'm not in your domain. Right? So somebody has to create a domain which invo includes both of us, right? and then specify what files we should both have access to, what files we shouldn't have access to. Right? So for example, if you're collaborating on a project, we want access to that, the project files, but not to my grade files or, or my tax files or whatever. Right? So you, you need to be able to add this stuff. Right? So you can either have the administrator do this stuff, or you can, you can let certain users give more access. So I can give access to somebody else. And that has to be expressed into this notion. Because if I can't like, give access, then it's, it's, it's not that interesting. So you need to be able to mark something here, say, I can give some access. Right? So it, it can never be the case that you can grab access from me. Only I can give you. Right? The, the owner can give somebody else an access, but the receiver cannot take the access away, I mean, automatically. Right? So that's, that's one thing you, you would specify. Um, see, the, 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 the other notion is, how I can change my role from one thing to the other, right? If I'm if I'm able to switch roles or what have you, right? Sort of like your your pseudo access, right? So if I want to be able to go from one domain to another domain, then I need to be able to switch, provide the switch access, right? So people have augmented the access control matrix to not only include the stuff we talked about before, but add the the switch notion. So that means that Domain D1 can switch to D2, right? But not to D3 or D4. So you can't change yourself from D1 to D2. So essentially, if you switch from D1 to D2, then you'll be able to use a laser printer. So if you want to, if D1 wants to print something, right, it has access to read F1 and F3, but it doesn't have access to the printer, right? So it has to change itself to D2 because it has access to do that. And then it can print that content. Like, yes? For something like that, if uh, D1 could switch to D2, since it was then in D2, could it also switch to D3 and D4? Yes. Yes. So if you if you switch to D1 to D2, right, so essentially it says you can switch to D3 and D4, and D3 and D4 can do other stuff, right? So um, it's kind of hard to prevent that, because to prevent that, you have another entry which says that if you went from D1 to D2, this is all you can do. D, D1, you know what I mean, right? So the more complicated you want to make it, the, the bigger the matrix becomes, right? You add rows or columns, and that's kind of hard. Yeah. So if there wasn't, in the D4 row, if there wasn't a D1 switch, you wouldn't, once you were in D4, you would be able to switch anywhere else. You would be like locked in that. Yes. Say. Yes. Okay. Yeah, if you, if you, yeah, so if you went from D1 to D2 and D2 to D4, then you are, you can't switch anywhere else. So you kind of, that's the, actually you can. Right, like if you took out the D1, like D4. Actually D3, D3 right? If you switch to D3, then you're, you're not switching anywhere, right? If you went from D1 to D2, D2 to D3, that's the end of the road for you, unless you have a mechanism to go back, right? And as you can imagine, like, managing this table is not a trivial task, right? Because there's all the, you have to debug it for all possible combinations of switches and where you end up and what you have to do and stuff, right? And so one of the, the problems with using these kind of systems is very quickly you would end up saying <laughs> give everybody every access, like sort of what you're doing as a, as a super user, right? So if you, I'm guessing most of you have like 100,000 uh, files in your machine and you know, few other resources, right? So imagine a mat matrix which has 100,000 columns and certain number of rows, and you're making sure it's all consistent, right? Because if there's inconsistency here, then you can, you can get more access than you wanted, right? So for example, if the first one they said, oh, <coughs> D1 does not have print access, right? So we should just escalate D1 to D2 and let it print, right? But the consequence is, once you're in D2, you, you also have access to go to D3 or D4. So essentially, if you can go to D3 or D4, then you, then you do the stuff. So the way you solve that is to 
duplicate D2 and make it just print access, or whichever way you, you want to do that, right? And it tends to get very hairy quickly. Right? So the, the 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 access, you know, passing access is is is, is uh, marked by a star, right? So which essentially says that D2 can read F2, but D2 can also give away these rights to other people. So essentially D2 can give read access from F2 to D3, right? So because it has a star, processors in D2 domain are allowed to give their access to somebody else. So they can only give read access here. And if it, you know, in, in, the, in the first case, D1 can give write access to others. So D1 can <coughs> give write access for F3 to any other domain, right? Whereas for the um, for F2, T2 can give read access, right? So by mentioning it as a start, you're saying that that particular domain can give that access away to other people, right? So, but D3 cannot give it to anybody else. So this is a way to pass access rights, but not to, um, but not forever, right? Now, of course, you can change it to say, I can pass my star access too, in which case it becomes even heavier to debug or, or operate on this one. And this is another, another thing stuff that actually uh, Unix does, right? So all this stuff says that who has access to give away uh, everything. But there's also a notion of an owner, and owners can do stuff even if they don't have access. And you can see that in your <coughs> Unix system, right? You can take away all access to yourself. You can say, <coughs> change, you know, change mark to have no access to your own files, and you can regain access back. You can change access even though you have no access to the file, right? So if you if you try to do a Uh, right. This basically says nobody has any access to the file, including me, right? User group and others have no access to the file. Then you're allowed to say right? you're actually giving yourself read access, whereas technically at this point you don't have any access anymore, so this should have failed, right? And the reason why you are able to do that is because you are the owner, and that's the, that's a notion you can explicitly add here. It says that you are the owner, so owner can create these privileges on the fly. They can create, you know, whatever accesses they want, even if they had no access. So in the first case, owner had no right access, but they can they can give themselves a right access in the second case. They can give themselves a delegate right access in the second case, right? So essentially, when you, when you do all this stuff, you know you 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 you, you come up with a, a fairly complicated access matrix, which lets you switch you know let, lets you switch from one domain to another domain, give access away to other other users and stuff. And the more 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 powerful you want to make it, the bigger the access matrix tends to become. Right. So the uh, the other 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 notion of um, so access matrix defines all the stuff. The, the, the one way to reduce the size of that is to have capability list, right? And that, that's the next the next mechanism. So essentially, what you do in capability is you turn it around and see what capabilities do I have, um, what files do I have access. So you, you essentially say, for D1, <coughs> I have a list which says I have access to F1, F3, and D2 switch, right? I specify all the rights that I have explicitly not against all the objects, but against ex the explicit rights I have, right? So those are the capabilities, those are the stuff that I'm allowed to do, right? There's an access matrix, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, or rather than go look through all the matrices, all, all the arrays to figure out what is it that I'm allowed to do, right? In a capability, I know what I'm, what I'm allowed to do because my capability or, or some sort of a token tells me what, what access I have to. It says that I have access to F1, F2, F3. So it explicitly uh, articulates what are the privileges I have for different objects, right? So it's a it's an implementation of the access matrix where I have a capability which says what I'm allowed to do, right? And 
I'm allowed to, I keep this capability, I can give this capability away, I can create a sub capability which says what I want to give, and I can give it that away to other users, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a subset implementation of, of the access matrix, right? The only difference is, now the system does not keep, keep track of this matrix anymore, right? Which basically says that, so D1 should have some kind of a token to say, I have access to F1 read, F3 read, D2 switch, and it gives that capability to anybody that who wants it to show. So it, it, it has to give the capability to the OS and say, I want to read F1, and here's my capability to show that I can read it. Right? I want to read F3, here's the capability. And I want to give my capability to you, so I create a, a, some, you know, some sort of thing and say, okay, here's a, my capability, right? So you can think of capability as your, uh, your <coughs> ID card or something, right? It, it has information about all the stuff that you can do, and essentially, I can give my card to you, and you, you become whatever access I have, right? And essentially, the card reader does not have to check anything. They, they, it knows from, from your card what access you have, right? So what would be the flip side of, of a capability-based system? What's the good, side, good thing about having a capability? The good thing would be the, the bad thing with access access uh, matrix, right? You don't keep track of a of a large matrix, right? Essentially, your your capability or, or whatever you bring in with you tells me what access you have. I don't have to the OS does not have to keep track of this in some large table, right? You essentially bring it with you, right? And the and the bad thing is, it's also the same thing. You bring it with you, so. Revocation, which is which which I haven't talked so far, becomes a big problem if you do that. Right? Revocation basically says that you know all this says is I can give you access, right? But there are cases when I want to take access back, right? We are all working on this class together, so I want to give you access to modify stuff. But at the end, at the end of the semester, you know we all lose access to write modify files to this course directory, right? For example, a new set of students come in. They have access to the files, not you anymore. So somebody has to be able to revoke the access, right? So revoking access in an access matrix is trivial. You just go and mark all the table entries off because <coughs> the OS has to look at the table anyway. So you just mark mark those things off, and you're you're good to go, right? Whereas in a capability-based system, right, you have this particular token or or some sort of a thing. So till that can be taken away, the capability is not gone, last, right? And since the OS does not keep track of a table like this, it has to hunt down who has these things and then take it back from them, right? You might have used one capabilities that without you realizing too much about it, which is the Kerberos tokens, right? How many of you use AFS on a sort of regular basis? Right? So when you log into you know, Kerberos, you get a token, right? You, you, you get a token that, uh, how many of you actually Given the token away to others, it, you can you can pass the token to others. You can pass, you can you can share the token with others. And I think that the Notre Dame tokens are usually one week, right? So if I give my token to you for one week, you have access to all the stuff I gave you. I can't take it back because you have the, the tokens cached, right? And some of you may have used um, on, on a remote sense, like, you know, using uh, tokens to um, XR with with X server, right? Essentially, I can give access control to my, my my screen to others by giving you a token, and as long as you have the token, you can you can modify my screen and stuff, right? So use some of this stuff in in uh, in, in regular life. Um, so, and, and there are there are there are a number of good good systems which have done that. So, so the newer Solaris um, provides a notion of a role based. Um, Access control. So essentially, I can take a number of different roles. So depending on the role I, ha I am, right, I get certain <coughs> privileges, right. So if I, so I can be me with a set of privileges. So depending on whether I'm a faculty or 
personal or you know staff or whatever role I take, I can get different privileges. Right? Linux has supports a, a notion of capability which is linked to the PASIC standard, right? Which which gives certain certain privileges for for files and stuff, right? It's not as well used as, as many as other other schemes. Um, and all of them, it, so the like like I said, the between between these two, if you compare the access list and the, and the capability notion, right? Access list are simple, and because you have one table, you just look it up, and then you kind of uh, do whatever operation you want on it, right? But the capability list, um, you have to figure out who has capabilities and then and then revoke them, and some of the mechanism that people use is every so often you have to reacquire it, right? And then that's basically what I was, I was saying as a, as a logout thing. So when you get the capability, you can force everybody to get it every so often, right? If you make the interval very small, then every time you have to go and ask somebody, then it's kind, it's kind of hard. So try to balance it such that it's useful and, and still is a good number, right? And, and Notre Dame chose one week. So essentially for one week, if you have the capability, you can do whatever you want. And after the end of the one week, you are, you are required to come back and ask the system. At that time, you can say, you have a new capability, and I can't give you the same one you had before. Right? And there are other mechanisms you can have pointers. So essentially, every time you use a capability, it has to follow a pointer to something which can be changed quickly. And the more complicated the scheme you make, the more overhead there is, because it, it has to check following these pointers and, and, and so on. Some of the very well-known um, examples of capabilities-based systems are the system called Hydra and Cambridge um, CAP, CAP file system. Cambridge file system was was uh, built around 75, 76 time frame, right, from Cambridge, uh, England, and it supported a good notion of capabilities. And Hydra was sort of in the time frame which, which actually had, you know, we said to implement all all the notion of of um, of, of uh, capabilities. So es essentially, it delegates the so the application processes create the notion of capabilities and the OS provides mechanisms to enforce that. Right. So the applications create what what these capabilities are and what they mean. Right. But the enforcement is done by the by the OS. Right. And this way, they can actually implement all the capabilities that you want. Because essentially. All the access control, all those things, you need to know specify what operations are allowed, like read, write, print, or what have you. Right? So all those interpretations are led to the applications, but the mechanisms are actually implemented by the OS. Right? And I'm going to quickly go through, I'll, I'll try to see if you can go through. Uh, so both the systems we talked about, the, the problem is access metrics are so big table no one wants to manage that that the humongous table. Capability based system have l limited success because you know they're 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 nice in some sense, but um, enforcing them is harder and stuff. So the one thing that you you might have actually used a lot more is language ba uh, based approaches. So if you can enforce if you can have the language enforce capabilities, right? Then it's a lot easier for users to use use that. That's the proposition, right? And the, the the most popular one that you might have used is the is the Java capability manager, right? How many of you use the Java capability manager <coughs> to do stuff other than the defaults? I use like sign signed outlet so you can enable the network connection. Java actually lets you like when you create a new object, right? You can put it under a protection domain and give it all the capabilities that it should have, and then essentially start it, right? So that's how they implement your applets, right? So if you run your program as an applet or as a as a regular program, right? Depending on how you run it, you get different different capabilities. So if you're running it as a program, then you're allowed to open a network connection to anywhere. If you're <coughs> applying as an applet, then you're only allowed to open a connection back to where you came from, right? And you and, and the way you implement that is through um, is through you know before you start a new object, right? If you initiate in New object, you specify all the all the capabilities that the object should have, and we'll continue with with this notion in the next class, right? But this is the the one thing that is useful, and probably people have used it. Actually, we meet on next Wednesday, right?
Okay, happy Easter.